Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Tech Talk presentation. Uh, my name is Emily Eastlake, and today I'm going to be giving you an introduction uh, to neural networks and to a very powerful library called TensorFlow. In this presentation, we'll talk about uh, what ten TensorFlow is, why it's popular, what it's used for, what a neural network is, and then I'll show you a convolutional neural network that I created for image classification. So first off, what is TensorFlow? Well, if you run a Google search, you'll find that TensorFlow is an open source software library released by Google to make it easier for developers to design, build, and train uh, deep learning module models. We're going to unpack what that means later in the talk, but let's start with this, which is why do we care? When TensorFlow was released in November of 2015, there were plenty of deep learning libraries already out there, and most of the features existed in one library and another. In addition, Google already had a proprietary machine learning system called Disbelief that enabled some really cool stuff. You could auto-caption images. In the upper right, you can see that there's a man on a beach flying a kite. And the auto-generated caption is a person on a beach flying a kite. <laughs> uh, you could generate trippy dreamscapes. And you could even search your Google Photos library for pictures of your cat. But despite all of this, TensorFlow has soared in popularity since its release. The image here shows Google Trends data for how searches of TensorFlow tutorial have grown against other machine learning libraries. Today, TensorFlow has over 1,500 project mentions on GitHub and is being used in over 6,000 open source repositories online. And the question is, why? Well, there are a few reasons. In addition to having a clean design and great documentation, TensorFlow is scalable, meaning that it's not only possible to break up work into chunks and run them in parallel across multiple CPUs and GPUs, but it also just supports distributed computing, which means that you can reasonably train large networks on humongous training sets using hundreds of servers. In addition, it's flexible. It runs on a wide variety of platforms, everything from Mac OS to Raspberry Pi, and you're not limited to neural networks or even to machine learning. You could run quantum physics simulations if you wanted. And the reason is that all TensorFlow does is carry out numerical computations using something called data flow graphs. In a data flow graph, the nodes represent operations and the edges represent data. When you work in TensorFlow, it defines a graph of computations to perform in what's known as the construction phase. On the left, you can see an example of a computation graph uh, for an equation that just accepts two variables and computes the result. Then TensorFlow takes this graph and runs it in what's known as the execution phase. The fact that TensorFlow does everything with computation graphs makes it particularly well suited to neural networks. Neural networks are a paradigm that are inspired by the idea that you could build an intelligent machine similar to how the brain works. So let's start our conversation by looking at a neuron, uh, the funny looking cell in your brain. On one end, the neuron has a bunch of dendrites that receive signals from other neurons, and on the other end, it has an axon. And at the end of that axon are synaptic terminal, ter terminals uh, that connect to the dendrites of other neurons. When a neuron receives a sufficient number of signals from other neurons within a few milliseconds, it fires its own signal. And that's all you need to know for the purposes of this presentation. On their own, biological neurons are pretty simple. Their power comes from being organized into network where each neuron is connected to thousands of others. The same principle applies to neural networks. In neural networks, instead of a neuron, we'd have an architecture like a perceptron. Instead of chemical signals, the perceptron receives input numbers, and each of them has a weight. It then computes a weighted sum of its inputs, and when that sum reaches a certain threshold, the perceptron produces an output. Having a single perceptron, like having a single neuron, is not very helpful. They can be used for simple bi binary classification problems and not much else. But just like with neurons, the magic happens when we take a bunch of perceptrons and wire them all together. A system like this is, ends up capable of learning amazingly complex patterns. Here's an example. Let's say that we have a neural network that's trying to identify whether this is a picture of a cat or a dog. Input comes in the form of pixel values, and each layer processes the data to some extent and then passes it along to the next layer. The connections, just like per the 
for the perceptrons have weights. And these weights are random at first. The same way that you were born with no inherent idea of a cat or a dog, the system starts out disorganized. It doesn't work. And that's because we need to give it some data. We need to train the network. So if we show the network many thousands of examples of cats and many thousands of examples of dogs, it learns to extract the salient features and make a prediction. If it's wrong, which it will be at the beginning, it automatically adjusts the weights just a little bit to try to improve the error. And when you do this over and over again through lots of iterations, which is called gradient descent, you end up with a model that can classify images that it's never seen before. For this presentation, I trained a model to look at images and classify what digits they are. I did this using the MNIST dataset, which is sort of like the hello world of machine learning. The MNIST dataset consists of images of handwritten digits like these and includes labels for what each image is. So I set up a neural network using only a different a couple different types of layers, which, without going into very much detail at all, is going to process the input at each layer kind of like this. So you can see we start at the bottom with a 20 by 20 image. When we feed it through the network, some of our layers filter it, like the first layer, and some of them downsample it, like the second layer, until we get to the point where the hard work happens and we've lost the spatial information altogether. At the end, we get a 10-dimensional vector containing the probabilities that the image we showed it is the digit at each index. And when I fed this model 55,000 points of training data and 10,000 points of test data, which is relatively small as far as machine learning applications go, and let it run 20,000 iterations on my four-year-old MacBook Air, which for the record, I don't really recommend, <laughs> It took a while, but I achieved 97.16% accuracy in classifying the test data. Now, I think the lowest error rate that anyone has ever achieved is 0.23%. So that's a little bit far away from that, but this is pretty cool. So now that you've got the basic idea, I encourage all of you to explore TensorFlow and maybe even see what amazing models you can create, like maybe drawing lions in the style of Vincent van Gogh. Thank you.